classical criminology is most often associated with Cesar Beccaria. Beccaria's work was based on a kind of free will, rationalistic hedonism, uh, which is a philosophical uh, tradition going back many centuries. And Beccaria proposed a simple model of human choice that was based on the rational calculation of costs and benefits. And on the basis of this model, he argued that punishment should be proportional to the seriousness of offenses so that the cost of crime always exceeds its rewards. And this approach became the basis for all modern criminal justice systems. Um, classical criminology emerged at a time when the um, when the social contract theorists began challenging the demon, the demonic, um, the demonic perspective um, that had dominated European thinking for more than a thousand years, and this approach formed the basis for criminal justice policies in most of Europe. And classical criminology was a protest against the criminal justice policies and against the demonic perspective of crime on which they were based. Um, the demonic perspective of crime and others like it formed the basis for very punitive criminal justice policies in Europe at that time and because crime was identified with sin the state claimed that the mor that they had the moral authority to use horrible and gruesome torture on criminals and it did it did this because the state claimed that it was acting in the place of god when it inflicted these horrible dra draconian punishments on criminals um, by the middle by the middle of the 1700s, just before Beccaria wrote his book, social contract theory was well known and widely accepted by many of the individual intellectuals of the day. Um, they did this did not represent, though, the thinking of the politically powerful groups that ruled the various states in Europe. And those ruling groups still held to the spiritual explanations or the demonic explanations of crime so that crime was seen as manifesting the work of the devil. And consequently, the criminal justice system of the time tended to impose excessive and cruel punishments on criminals. Beccaria was a protest writer who sought to change these excessive and cruel punishments by applying the rationalist social contract ideas to crime and criminal justice. Um, in some ways, uh, it's not a coincidence that this came, you know, right before the American Revolution of 1776 as well as the French Revolution of 1789. Both of these occurred soon after the publication of his book in 1764. And there is evidence that some of the ideas that he provided uh, were very popular and may have inspired um, our founding fathers. And so therefore his ideas um, served as the basis for new criminal justice systems. From America and France, his ideas spread to the rest of the industrialized world. Beccaria, um, it's really funny, the way that this book came about, he was a very average student. He had some interest in mathematics, but that was about it. Later, he was given an assignment uh, in 1763 to write an essay on penology. He knew nothing about prisons. Still, he turned out a very interesting book. 
um, one that we're still talking about well over 200 years after it was written. I'm going to give some of the highlights of this point of this book, but I wanted to give just a word of caution. This is in no way meant to replace the actual reading of this book, and I'm going to give points that may not even be the most important aspects of the book, and as you're reading it, you will be encouraged and asked in the discussion to identify, you know, areas that I didn't cover. In a 10 to 12 minute lecture, realistically, there's no way we can possibly cover every aspect of the book, but I did want to turn to a few points that I consider to be very interesting. Um, he argues that the role of legislatures um, should be to define crimes and to define specific punishments for each crime. And this view contrasted with the practice of Beccaria's time when legislatures passed general laws, but they left the implementation up to the discretion of the judges. So it may not be any surprise then that he felt that the role of judges should be to determine guilt, that is, whether the defendant committed the crime. And once that determination was made, then the judge should follow the law in determining the punishment. He did not like vast discretion among judges, and Beccaria argued that judges should have no discretion whatsoever. And if you turn to page 15, the last paragraph, he, he writes, Nothing is more dangerous than the popular axiom that it is necessary to consult the spirit of the laws. It is a dam that has given way to a torrent of opinions. And so I found that to be very interesting. Uh, another point that I thought was equally interesting is that he felt that excessive severity not only fail to deter crime, but it actually increases it. Turn to page 43 and look at the last few sentences. He writes, The severity of punishment of itself emboldens men to commit the very wrongs it is supposed to prevent. They are driven to commit additional crimes to avoid the punishment for a single one. The countries and times most notorious for severity of penalties have always been those in which the bloodiest and most inhumane of deeds were committed for the same spirit of ferocity that guided the hand of the legislators also ruled that of the parasite and assassin. And so that's very compelling. Um, he also would argue that the seriousness of a crime is determined by the extent of harm that it inflicts on society. And he argued that other factors were relevant in determining seriousness, including the intent of the offender, which I found to be very interesting. Turn to page 65 and look at the end of the second paragraph. He writes, Sometimes with the best intentions, men do the greatest injury to society. At other times, intending the worst for it, they do the greatest good. And so, it's very, very interesting. And it, I wish that he were alive today, because I'd have some questions to ask him about that. But if we're to read this straight for, for what it's written and for how it's been interpreted, he would say that intent is not what should be looked at. Rather, look at the harm. If the act doesn't result in harm, well then it shouldn't be punished so severely. At least that's what I'm getting from that. Um, and um, let's now turn over to page 58. Um, he writes, The certainty of a punishment, even if moderate, will always make a stronger impression than the fear of another, which is more terrible but combined with the hope of impunity. Even the least evils, when they are certain, always terrify men's minds. So he's talking about the certainty of punishment, meaning the idea that you will get caught. And subsequent research that was conducted in the 19, late 1960s, 1970s, and even today, has shown the certainty is one of the most important aspects as to whether or not a crime will be deterred. 
severity is not that important. If you, if shoplifting gave you a five or ten year sentence, but there was a one percent or zero percent certainty you'd be caught, wouldn't really, really matter. Whereas if on the other hand there was a ninety nine or a hundred percent certainty you would be caught shoplifting and you'd be given a verbal reprimand of a harsh nature, that according to Beccaria would be more likely to deter. So it's very interesting. Um, which leads me to my next point. The purpose of punishment is to deter. Therefore, punishment should be proportionate to the seriousness of the crime. And look on page 62, he writes, It is to the common interest not only that crimes not be committed, but also that they be less frequent in proportion to the harm they cause society. Therefore, the obstacles that deter men from committing crimes should be stronger in proportion as they are contrary to the public good and as they are inducements to commit them stronger. Um, he also argues that laws should be published. This way we, uh, the public knows what they are supporting. And he also argues that capital punishment should be abolished, although he does make an exception. See if you can find, when does he say that it's okay to have capital punishment? There is at least one limited instance when it's okay. Um, he published this work anonymously. He did not want to be um, condemned, and he defended himself in the introduction against being an unbeliever or revolutionary, but the Roman Catholic Church did not take kindly to his book and they placed it on the index of forbidden books where it remained for more than 200 years. However, despite this opposition, his book was very well received by his intellectual contemporaries. The theory would fall in and out of favor for the next 200 plus years. It still is in favor in some circles, not so much in others. It would, be, it would not be until 1968 when uh, Jack Gibbs, criminologist, actually tested this theory. And we'll talk about that more next week. Um, for now, though, there is quite a bit to absorb. Enjoy reading this book. Um, and again, like I alluded to, there is much, much that I did not talk about. See what he says about the classification of crime. See what he says about dueling. Um, there are just a lot of really interesting things that I think are applicable today and uh, may even be more so than the time in which uh, he laid this masterpiece out. So I will put up some discussion questions and see you online.